When it comes to leadership, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Character is what eventually makes or breaks leaders. Yet, it's the most ignored and overlooked aspect of leadership development today. We have the perfect leadership role model, and that's Jesus. We simply need to follow his lead, allowing him to work in and through us. Welcome to Lead Like Jesus podcast. Leadership starts on the inside. That is Rich Cummins. I am Freddie Scott, and this is the Lead Like Jesus podcast. This is your show, Kingdom Leaders, and we understand that leadership starts on the inside, and we've got a great show for you. In today's episode, we're talking about the heart of leadership. Why is it so hard to keep our hearts right? And then we're going to have a prayer for servant leadership. You know, it's interesting when you talk about servant leadership, it's it's really intriguing. It reminds me of a really cool story, Rich, uh, back in 2005 of the tennis champion, Andy Roddick. And I'm not sure if you remember this or, or the audience remembers this. He was playing a match against Fernando Verdasco. And Verdasco was about to lose his second set, serving what seemed to be the last opportunity to save the game. And the umpire called the ball out which would call the match in favor, of course, of Andy Roddick. And usually a sports player, when an umpire makes a ruling like that, you just take it, you don't, you don't question it. You just say, hey, the ball bounced in my way, but not Andy in this situation. Andy had seen that the ball had barely touched the line and refused to accept the umpire's call. Instead, he challenged the call against himself. The play continued and he eventually lost the match. And in a split second, Andy Roddick's integrity was tested. And it showed that he was far willing not to go and do by any means necessary to win. But he realized that day that his name was more important. In fact, not only did he lose the match, he lost tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars between the winning purse versus second place of potential prize money. And, but most importantly, he preserved his good name. Andy decided long before the match that his integrity was more valuable than success. Now, even though most of us may not ever become a pro tennis player or professional athlete, but on a daily basis, all of us face Andy type moments where we have to decide how far are we willing to go to get ahead. And those Andy type moments test us and they reveal a lot about what's going on in our heart and our internal values. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Rich, what does your heart have to do with leadership? Well, first of all, you're talking Andy Roddick and I'm a tennis guy. I used to play tennis in high school for a little bit. I played for two years and I finished out in football. And so when you're talking about Andy Roddick, I know who you're talking about, but it immediately made me think of John McEnroe. When you want to contrast, you know, integrity issues and matters of the heart, you, uh, you know all about John McEnroe. So when you ask the question, you know, what does that mean? I say everything. The heart is our why. It's so important. Um, within the heart lies the reasons why we do what we do. It's our intention, our motivation. It's the core of who we are. So it's everything that we do and who we are. And, you know, I, I'm going to share a quick story with you, too, because I'm, I'm a proud dad. I know you are, too, Freddie. Remind me, four boys and a girl, right? That's it. That's it. Well, I got four girls and a boy. So I'm the inverse of you. So I only get a little bit of testosterone time, <laughs> just a little bit of it. And so I had a proud dad moment the other day. You know, I, I, I've shared vehemently with my kids about the heart of a leader and why it matters and integrity. And I remember back when I was a young man, I mean, it was a little bit ago, but it was, it was, uh, there was a time when I was a young man and um, I was on my way to pay for sign up and pay for my classes at school, Purdue University. And so I walked into the registrar's office. I signed up for my classes and then I was walking out heading to the bursar's office. Well, there was a guy just in front of me who had done the same thing. Well, lo and behold, an envelope dropped out of his back pocket and he kept on moving. I looked down the hallway and there wasn't anybody to be found, but there was this, this envelope and it was not a sealed envelope. It was chock full of bills. I mean, it was, it was money. I mean, cheddar, it was cash. And so I picked it up and, and I looked up and he was gone. Well, I chased this guy down because I knew immediately the right thing to do was to give him this money. 
Well, sure enough, he was in the bursar's office scratching his head. He was going to have to pay for school and he'd lost his tuition money. So I gave it right back to him. Well, I've shared that story with my kids and the proud dad moment came the other day. I was at the arcade with my son, just turned 16. And we went to, uh, to have some fun with him and some of his buddies. Well, lo and behold, somebody dropped a $50 bill on the ground and my, my son picked it up and he looked at his friends and he knew immediately what he needed to do. Well, he did have a friend in his ear. My son told me later on and said, dude, you need to keep that. Just keep it. I mean, we're going to play. That's the Lord blessing you. Yeah. My son knew. He, he heard my voice in his ears. He went and turned that in. And he came back and he told me later. And I was just so proud, Freddie. So the heart of why we do things, it really matters. And, and I'm just blessed to see the influence I've had on my own kids. They're not always going to get it right, but he got it right in that moment. You know, it's amazing. I'm reminded of uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7, where the word of God says that the Lord does not look at people the way that the way people look at that God, the people look at outward, at outward appearance, but God looks at what's going on in our hearts. And the reality of that is the world always deals things totally 180 degrees opposite the way God does. It's a our heart motivation that's most important. What's going on behind the words and the actions? That's what matters the most. Women understand this all the time. Like if someone's trying to talk to you a certain kind of way or whatever, but if you don't believe the intent of the pursuit is honorable, is, is, is worthy of trust, if you think that there's an ulterior motive behind it, then you're not gonna be open and receptive to anything that that person does. We understand that is in sales or any other thing, the heart behind the words and the actions matter because it impacts how you process what you say and, it process, and, and how they process what you say and how they receive what you do. If I don't trust you, I don't care what you say or do, it's gonna impact my capacity to lead you. And so, Talk a little bit about Mark chapter 12, about how Jesus saw that. There's an amazing story in there, Rich. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, and Freddie, I've, I've been in the nonprofit world for a long time. Before that, I was in the business world. So sales and fundraising, I've been exposed in, to those worlds. And so, you know, this was an interesting story in the Bible that was so much more important than, than uh, fund development or tithing or anything of that matter. It had to do with the widow with two mites. And she gave, as Jesus said, out of her poverty. And so as you look at the Pharisees or the, the people around her that were probably giving a much greater uh, amount of money, the percentage of what she gave, she did not have. And so she just felt so compelled to give. She gave what she had and truly gave out of, out of her poverty. And so that, that to me means so much when you look at the inside of a person what motivates them what drives them to do what they do well this widow she knew that she wanted to bless the lord back with what she had and even though somebody was probably giving 50 or 100 or 200 times more than she gave that didn't matter because god knew what was in her heart you know what's interesting is uh, obviously there are kingdom leaders that are watching this and listening to this and we all have a heart to want to have the type of impact that will glorify God. But this topic today is really that time just to hit pause and look in the mirror, right? That yeah. I can have a title, I can have this position, I can do things at the church, I can do all these things. But at the end of the day, what really matters most is what's going on right here in my own heart. What is the motivation to why I'm pursuing those things? What is the motivation between with why I am doing what I do. Now, you can do all the right things, but if they're done for all the wrong reasons, and we just talked about 1 Samuel 16, 7, that God is looking at our hearts. Rich, what's the consequence or what are some of the dangers of not getting this right and authentically looking at our own hearts and making sure we have the right heart motives? You know, Freddie, what we say, the biggest barrier, the most persistent barrier to leading like Jesus 
is a heart motivated by self-interest. And so what are the consequences? That's everybody watching us. You know, if my son would have seen a different view of his dad, he might have picked that money up and put it in his pocket. And, and then his friends would have seen that. And then they would have had that attitude potentially. And so the attitude of uh, give a little and take a lot is kind of the mantra for the self-serving leader. And those leaders really operate out of fear and pride. And in turn, they drive people away because, because of this sense of greed or this authoritative, or I should say authoritarian type of leader. And so, you know, you were talking about trust a little bit ago. And so a trust buster is definitely somebody that is self-motivated and self-interested. And so when I think about Jesus, and there's a beautiful example in Luke 4, when he was tested uh, coming out of the wilderness or coming out of his 40 days, and, you know, Jesus was tempted by Satan with bread uh, from stones turning into bread. And then Jesus was also tempted about taking over all of the land and then even being thrown off of the temple and having his angels uh, come and save him. And so when you think about those core areas of self-interest, it would be appetites and an abuse of power or, or, or even approval in some cases, and then ambition. And so leaders that are motivated by the wrong heart are not only going to make bad decisions, but they're going to lead other people to potentially make bad decisions. And Freddie, we see it all around us. And I'm going to cue you up on one here too. So let's talk about what happens when a person's competence, their skill set outpaces their character. Well, it's so I'll, I'll give you a backdrop within athletics. We, we see it all the time with high profile athletes where you have this physical ability to run fast, throw far, jump high, things of that nature. But their character is the thing that takes away opportunity. In fact, some coaches say it this way, the, your talent is the floor, but your character is the ceiling. And I can tell you there's countless stories of individuals that though they may be gifted physically with their God-given ability, it's not addressing the issues of the heart and who they are as a person and understanding the importance of developing their character that not only did doors close, their name was tarnished and future opportunities to have gainful employment or other things were totally taken away because they overemphasize the outward appearance and, and running and doing and making plays and, and the accolades that people throw on you and forgot that what's in your heart is ultimately gonna be the thing that opens up any door that you're really gonna have. And then another danger, uh, I'll take another step, is coaches leading by fear. So if, you, if I'm a coach and I feel um, I have this player that's talented, but they've got all these character issues, they're a bad teammate, they're bringing other people down, they're coming late to meetings, they're not accommodating and, and buying into what we're trying to build, but they're fast and they can make a play. Well, when you accommodate and you make rules for the group and don't make, make it apply for that quote unquote star player, well, what do you think, what message is being told to everybody else? Does their character really matter? Does that care, did, does doing the right thing, coming on time, working hard, doing the right thing the right way all the time, that consistency of discipline, does that really matter? Is the coach just gonna play this guy or that girl? And so there's a danger culturally as a leader when we lead by fear because I'm scared of losing my job or this is a high performer and I don't wanna quite discipline them because to look at the results of what they're doing, but the character not only is costing them individually, but their character is also impacting the culture and the organization. And that sometimes becomes a greater impact because now I can't lead a group because they don't see me being willing to make the tough decision and being able to deal with not only my personal issues if I have them, or issues within the organization that I'm supposed to lead as well. Mm. 
Boy, that brings to mind a, a good question. And I'm going to talk in terms of a rock star employee. And I don't mean rock star in lifestyle. I just mean an employee that is a high performer. Their values are right. They're getting it done. And when you have a leader that's motivated out of self-interest and doing some of the things that you mentioned, what does that say to a rock star employee? And what is that rock star employee going to do? Well, first, we need to be clear on what is a rock star employee, right? Is the rock star employee just someone that's, so I use a football and vernacular. A first round draft pick is a first round draft pick because of their physical ability, right? That they can run, they can jump, they can do all of these things that I feel like may be a generational talent that God just blessed them with something. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a rock star from the standpoint of someone that I can trust. That's got to be proven over time. So, if as a leader, I think a rock star is someone that just has talent, but not character, then that then I'm messed up it on on day one. But if I realize the rock star employee is that person that is going to do the right thing at the right time, they I don't have to micromanage them. I can trust them to do the right thing, not just personally, but organizationally. And when that person looks around and they see other people that are not bought in, they're not doing the right thing at the right time, and that we're only focusing on the outward appearance, what the public sees, uh, and and knowing, and and we all under, we've all been in these situations where everybody in the building knows that that person isn't living up to the right standard. That leader loses credibility. Not only do you lose the credibility, but now that rock star. Now questions, do I need to stay all in? Ah, good point. And, and if I'm not, times... because if, if I'm not valued, if these attributes aren't valued, then why should I continue to pursue that here? Should I look to find some place that will value what I bring to the table? And so now you lose potentially a gem in the cornerstone to your organization or to your group because I got this thing out of whack. Mm, that's great. That's exactly where I was heading to. Um, there's something to be said and help, help me elaborate on this more. I've heard it said this way by a colleague of mine. You don't want to be a public hero, but a private failure. What does mm. that mean to you? Well, a lot of times, you know, within the athlete lens, I grew up in the public eye newspaper clippings, people cheering your name in the stands, people want your autographs, and you can get so caught up into public persona that you forget that God's called you to have a private life that honors and reflects him and doing it in such a way that you're totally full and satisfied with your personal relationship with Jesus. And when that is not in place. If I am still sort of on that buzz, on that high of needing other people's validation and affirmation, if I am still motivated by external things as opposed to having peace internally, then that in and of itself is going to drive and motivate what I do, the time I spend, how I spend and value my time and energy and in my pursuit, I will bend over backwards to try to get the likes and the bat, pats on the back and things of that nature, as opposed to being able to have the self-confidence and the self-assurance and knowing that I'm loved because I know who loves me and I don't have to bow to the whims of people and, and go through that entire process. And so it, it just boils down to, am I, do I have that internal peace? where I don't need to pursue that, or do I still need that? And if I find myself, if you're listening to this or watching this and you find yourself still motivated externally, now's the time to assess and ask God to and help you deal with that because you, you can't serve God and man, mm -hmm. right? You, you, can't, you can't have two masters. It's gonna be one or the other. And, and I think Jesus is a really good master to have. <laughs> Well, let me illustrate it with another, uh, another Bible concept or Bible story. Uh, you know, we would think of Gideon and we think in terms of Gideon as the success he had over the Midianites. You know, he, he was very insecure at first. He didn't want to go fight them, but an angel 
convinced him to do so. And then he went and he fought the, the, the Midianites. And um, at the end of that story, instead of ruling the, the nation or taking over a leadership uh, uh, position, Gideon asked to, for an ephod to be created. So it's almost like this gold plate that he would wear around or golden garb that would bring him honor. And then when people would see him and talk to him, he had this thing that would, would stand out and say, I did something great. And But when you follow that through, even though he was trying to live in this public persona, uh, Gideon had 72 kids and one of his children he had with a prostitute. And so there was this public side, but then there was this private side as well. And so when you follow the story out, Gideon's next in, in line, uh, his son Abimelech was the son that came from that prostitute. He took, he took over the leadership of Israel. And the first act he did as the leader is he killed 70 of his brothers, killed 70 of them. And so he ended up dying off and, you know, the children of Israel were not obedient and, and, and all of that. And we know how the story goes, but the point is having this public persona, but an inconsistent private life can lead to a lot of wreckage and a lot of damage. Well, I, and I'm just reminded there's, I think all of us can think of countless stories of people that have impacted us personally or, or not that far removed of, the, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe, believe they did, or I can't believe they are accused of this because of our perception of who they were and what they meant to us um, in modeling leadership or, or the standard that we automatically place on people that we call our leaders or people that we've chosen to be influencers in our hearts and lives. And Obviously, no one is perfect, and by all means, don't hear that we're saying or expecting that you know everyone here is going to live this perfect life. There's only one that did that perfect, and that's Jesus. But what we are saying is that we should be intentional and authentic in assessing where we are. Right? It's almost like use the analogy of. When you, when you get a car, when you first get your car, you know, it's fine. But every now and then you need to get maintenance and you're going to need to rotate and realign and rebalance your tires. Because if not, you're going to start driving. <laughs> you're going to be driving like this because you haven't taken the time to periodically reassess where things are and making sure that things are properly balanced. And in life, I think that's what happens sometimes. I don't think uh, most people have a, an intent to drift from God or to drift into some of these spaces. I think sometimes it's just one or two degree difference of what true north was versus I start looking another way. And before I know it, down the road, you find yourself a far, a far off from where I thought I'd end up. But it did start that way. It starts with these small increments and small degrees of, of change, of, of not being aware of what's going on in our hearts. So again, we're just asking that we should be intentional about reassessing and reevaluating where we are and the motivation behind what we do and why we do what we do. I got to tell you, you're getting me to thinking right now. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about those habits or what are those things that can keep us in maintenance, if you will, with our integrity and with our heart. And so we know in Lead Like Jesus, uh, having solitude, time with the Father, Having a good prayer life and scripture, those are very important things. But there's also another one that's pretty important. And that other one is having supportive relationships. And so mm. how can the relationships in our lives sharpen us to do the right thing? So as we're looking internally, what does it mean to have people on the outside speaking into our lives? You know, it's interesting. I, I've said this to a group of NFL rookies, and I, and I say this to youth all the time, you know, the people that got you here may not be equipped to get you there. That sometimes we mistake the fact that we all may have friends or peers or people that were in your circle in the past and, and we can create this bond and, and confuse loyalty with thinking that that person or that group is also equipped to help you do the things that God's called you to do. And if that group is not does not have the same values or have not, not pursuing God the way you are. If, they, if there's a drift in that space, I can't allow, and I'm talking family members, um, 
old classmates, old, for me, old teammates, even though I can love them and appreciate them, the degree of influence that I allow them to continue to have in my life has to be assessed. You know, Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together lest they be agreed? I have to choose who I'm walking this life with and who I'm going to allow to feed me information that will give me insight. Are they telling me the things that's helping me or hurting me? Am I flocking with eagles or with pigeons? Those are two entirely different birds. Or and, chickens. But, I've heard chickens. They're on the ground. <laughs> they need to soar. But, but we ought to be mindful of that and be mindful of being intentional about the types of people that we're allowing to speak into us because all of it matters. All of it matters. Every relationship, every phone call, every tweet, every text, every person that you're connected to on social media, if you're on social media, all of it matters. All it takes is one text, tweet, video, anything. And now it's in your thought life and now you're running. And the question is, are the people around you feeding you content that's fueling your assignment? Or are that that person that, oh, sometimes they give me some of that sketchy stuff that, ooh. And, and again, I'm not saying you have to throw them out with the, throw them out, but you have to keep it in the proper perspective of whether or not how much of my heart. The Bible says we have to guard our hearts with all diligence. We are the ones responsible for guarding our hearts, and we are the only ones that can do it. Amen. Well, as we wrap today, what are our final thoughts? What do we want to impart on our audience now, Freddie, as far as everything in terms of the inside element of leadership? Well, our values become our foundation, right? And, and those values have to stand the test of time and stand through all the storms of life. And only then can we be the leaders of integrity who can build our houses on the rock of Jesus Christ instead of the shifting stands of situations. So I just encourage you to rely on the foundation that Jesus is our rock. He is relevant and he is helping us and is equipping us to be able to have the authentic, transparent, vulnerable leadership that allows us to, from our heart, to be able to connect with those we're called to love and to lead. Mm. Pass that plate to me, Freddie, because I've got my two, two mites that I want to throw in. Give us a prayer, uh, brother. Let's, let's close this out and give a good, solid prayer so people can, uh, can walk in the ways of the Lord and lead the way Jesus led. Father, we just thank you again for an opportunity to glean from your word and to support each other as we desire to please you in all that we say and that we do. We understand that you are looking at our heart. And Father, we just ask you to forgive us to cleanse us, to keep our hearts right so that way we can serve you and the things that's in our hearts allows us to be authentic and powerful as we speak and do the things that you instruct us to say and to do that at the end of the day, they will be able to see you living in us and that's it. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Again, leadership starts from the inside. Go ahead, Freddie. Well, again, until next time, I'm so excited that you're here. Make sure you subscribe and stay connected to up upcoming episodes, and we will see you next time.